rainy Sunday morning. Uh, a couple of reminders as we get started. So we're, we're talking through the book of Romans, so there'll be a sermon this morning, and then this evening at 7, back in the children's wing, we'll take the adults back there, we'll create chaos, it'll be loud, uh, but we'll do Bible studies. So bring your Bible and a notebook, and we'll talk about a lot of things. Uh, it's kind of free-flowing for a little bit of it. We'll talk about the content of what we're talking about this morning. So it's 7 o'clock tonight. And then I've been reminded twice this morning, and several times through the week, by my wife about the progressive dinner. So a progressive dinner is, it's a lot of fun because you get together as a group of people. So what is it, eight people maybe? It depends on how many people sign up. But you get groups of six to eight. And then as a group, you travel from one house to another and you enjoy like courses courses of a meal. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, she should, why don't you just stand beside me and then that way you just, Whisper in my ear what I'm supposed to say. Um, so it's, it's actually, it's a lot of fun, okay? Even if you're an introvert like me, it gets you out with a group of people and you go house to house and you get to chat and you get to hear stories about, you know, you get to meet people, really, maybe people that you haven't ever really met before or haven't spent any time with. But you have to sign up, right? Otherwise, you'll be eating dinner alone in the cold loneliness of your own home. Or maybe not. (laughs) Some of the introverts are excited about that. Uh, But then, oh yes, and child care is provided. As well as dinner for your children. It's simple. Sounds simple. Just have to clean your house. All right, every, okay. (laughs) Progressive dinner, sign up, see you there. In case you're wondering where the sign-up sheet is, it's right out there, right through those doors, right on the, uh, where we sign children in. Okay, can we move on, please? (laughs) Uh, This is our communication card. If you'd like to uh, update your information, you can do it through the card. You can also give us prayer and praise requests, and we would be happy to pray with you for those things. Let's pray together as we get started. Father, I thank you for your goodness to us, Lord. I thank you for the way that you love us. And Father, as we think about your word this morning, I pray, Lord, you'd help us to have great clarity and understanding. But also, Lord, as we sing and rejoice and praise you, help us to praise you with hearts full of goodness and love, your goodness and your love. And so, Lord, we ask you for your help this morning. We thank you for your goodness. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Please stand. All right.
Father, let your kingdom come. Holy, holy. Father, let your will be done. Move as a king. Let it be done. Right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Holy, holy. Father, let your will be done. Move as a king. Let it be done. Right here in my heart. Who's as in heaven, right here in my
was nice. Good job singing. Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I say, you know, besides me and Mary, who are kind of crazy and <laughs> like to play instruments, uh, everybody else up here is because the Lord kind of pushed them out of their comfort zone and said, I need, I need you for, to build my kingdom. I need you to serve. So, like, Grant never played bass before, and Nikki was a dancer. She wasn't a drummer, right? Tony's never sang on Have you ever sang on stage before? No. Not on a microphone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't know about Lord. You, you, a little bit? Yeah, not like you didn't do it for, like, at home. And you're, yeah. You didn't go, like, schedule gigs to go sing in front of people. Yeah. <laughs> so... You know, the Lord can use you. So if the Lord's calling you to do something out of your comfort zone, trust him. And he'll push it. You know, it might be a little uncomfortable, but, you know, but usually if, if, if the Lord's pushing you in that direction, he keeps reminding you of that. Then it, it's probably a good thing. It's probably a good thing. Um, today, today, Pastor Todd's going to be uh, uh, finishing up uh, Romans chapter 2. And Romans chapter 2 kind of talks about religion. It talks about the Jewish people. And Paul, Paul tells them, your religion is not going to save you. That's what he's telling them. And I can relate to that. Because I, I was raised in a religion. Right? I was, I was raised religious. And I don't think that saved me. It didn't. Um, you know, you have, you have to come to the realization that doing your best, doing going to church ain't going to cut it, that you need to ask the Lord, is it, Lord, I'm not good enough, I'm like trying to do this religion thing, and I'm still feel empty, I, like, it seems silly sometimes, like, why do we, why does Buddy get up there and play guitar and act like a fool, like, like, what's, what in the world, and, um, and it's, it's because, because God saves us wherever you're at, it doesn't have to be in a church, it doesn't, uh, you know, it could be laying in your bed at home by yourself, and, you know, you heard something that day, and, and you said, you know what, Lord, I, I need you. And you'll see, after that happens, he'll start working. He'll be like, yeah, welcome home. Welcome home. And then we go to church to hang out with other people that believe in Jesus like us, and we have a good time. It's a fel what a fellowship, what a joy divine, right? It's nice, to, you know, I know whenever I get around someone that I know is a believer, like, you, get, you can feel it, like, yeah, this person's this person's in the club. It's kind of nice because you can feel comfortable and safe. You don't have to you know worry about what they're thinking about you. Or, you know you know it's all good. So let's just praise the Lord for that because He is He is the highest. He is holy forever. Amen. Right? Yeah. Let's praise. Yeah. Just cry. creation cries holy you are lifted high holy holy forever a thousand generations falling down in worship Sing the song of ages to the Lamb. 
again. Um, so this is from my door, right? Um, thank you. Uh, this, uh, everybody put, uh, or most of you, many of you, some of you put uh, a thank you for uh, Pastor Appreciation Month. I just want to tell you, I feel appreciated all the time. I, I really do. And it's because of you. I feel appreciated all the time. Every time I, well, sometimes not when I walk into the staff meeting, but <laughs> almost every other time I feel appreciated. And so thank you. Thank you so much for this. Staff around here can be um, rough. <laughs> I say that in Christian love. She's in the back of the room. She knows what I'm saying. But while I'm here, let me also just thank Lori and the care team for an excellent barn party last night. It was a lot of fun. Um, and, and of course, we had Buddy came out and did some music. And so it was, it was a really good time. Uh, kids were dancing. Uh, it was off the chain. Food was great. Um, so it was a good time. Next time we have something, come on out. It'll be a good time. It'll be a lot of fun. The word holy means perfectly pure and distinct from all others. And so when we sing that song, we are declaring the goodness of God, that God is perfectly pure and distinct from all others. There is no other God but our God. What a beautiful song. And so thanks. Well done. We're in the book of Romans. And the book of Romans is hard because it's, it's theology and it's, it's ideas that we have to wrestle with and think through. And people through human history, religious people, have been crazy. They are. I'm going to tell you about a man. His name was Simon. Simon the Stylite. Okay? This is the 400s. So in, in the history of the church... You have the early church where Christians were kind of hunted by the Romans and by the Jewish people. They didn't like Christians. In 313, Christianity became legal. In the 400s, people who were in church were like, there's too much world in the church. We need to get away from it all. And they did. They decided, seriously religious people decided, hey, we're going to create a monastery and we're going to just have really, really, really religious people there. And we're going to live in very small sections of the building. We're going to sleep in uncomfortable situations. And this wasn't enough for some of the crazy religious people in the past. There was a man named Simon who got kicked out of the monastery because he was too strict. Can you imagine? He's already sleeping in a cell. He's up all night praying. He's doing all these religious things. And he's too much for the religious people. So he lived in a hut by himself for a year and a half. And the problem he had with that is that people started coming to visit him because he was so strict and serious in his devotions, they wanted him to pray for them. Simon, pray for me. I've got this problem. And you are so deeply devout and religious. And so Simon, after a while, he's like, I've got to get away from all these people. So here's what he did. He created a platform on a pole. You think I'm kidding. I'm not kidding at all. He did this. Can you come help me for a second? Just hold that right there. Thanks, Bubba. So Simon decided that he was going to get away from it all. He created a 10-foot platform. You see his little platform there. And he put it on a pole 50 feet in the air. People would bring him... Uh, something to eat. They'd bring him, you know, flatbread and goat's milk. And he would live on top of this pole. And people would come and they would climb a ladder to talk to him and say, Simon, thanks, Bubba. Simon, would you pray for us? Simon, would you disciple us? Simon, would you teach us? He delivered lectures from the top of this pole. He was so religious, he wanted to get away from the world. He's on a pole 50 feet high. How long do you think he sat on top of that pole? 10 days? I got 10 days. Two years. 60 days. How many? 40 days? 40 what? Sold. 37 years. For 37 years, he wanted to get away. He wanted to be so religious, so devoted to God that for 37 years, he sat on top of a pole. 
He would do exercises in addition to his incredible devotions, right? He would do toe touches where he would lean over and touch his toes and stand back up. And so somebody's watching him on top of this pole. They counted. How high do you think he got in his toe touches? How many, how many toe touches would you do? I'm like five, you know, 10. I'd have to go see the chiropractor after 20. 1,244, and then the person watching stopped counting. His devotion was crazy. He was so devoted. He was so religious. Surely someone that committed to God would earn the right to stand before him. But I don't think so. Because I don't think that's what the text of Scripture tells us. Is the, true, is the truth. He taught disciples, he wrote letters, he lectured all from the top of a pillar. That's not enough. Now we're in the book of Romans and we're closing out the sin section. And the book of Romans has a very definite, specific structure. And Paul is talking systematically about different people. In the first section, he talks about the obvious sinner. And so we created this character, uh, and I had to give him a name, right? And I didn't find a name in English that I liked, so I called him Mr. Schmutzig, right? The, the obvious sinner. And if you look at Romans 1, it's going to tell you about this guy. He knows from creation that God is, and he decides he doesn't care. He's just going to sin. And so he just wallows around in sin, right? The obvious sinner. And so you have other people, Mr. Morals, he's got rules. What's he going to think about this guy? Oh, yeah, that guy's obviously, oh, he's obviously a sinner. He's obviously under the judgment of God. But then Paul turns the question to Mr. Morals, and he says, do you think that your rules are going to be enough? Can you follow your own rules perfectly? Anybody who's ever been on a diet says, <laughs> no. If you can't follow your own rules, how are you going to follow God's rules and thus earn some special standing before God? And so finally, Paul turns to the religious person. That's who we're going to talk about today. Can he be religious enough to earn a right standing with God? The book of Romans is going to continue on. It's going to talk about salvation. That comes next week. And then an idea called sanctification, how to grow in a relationship to God. The fourth section, I don't like this title, it's from somebody else. It's about the people of Israel. And how do the people of Israel connect to the people of the church? That's an important question. And then finally, the section on service. Now in the sin section, we've met Mr. Schmutzig, the obvious sinner. We've met Mr. Morals, the good person. And so today, we're going to talk about the, um, the religious man. Mr. Schmutzig has a low level of light. But he understands enough to know. And that's what the text of, of Romans tells us. He understands enough to know that there's a God. But he doesn't know enough to get right with God. And he doesn't care. Paul uses the longest vice list in the New Testament to say, this guy, if you can imagine a sin, he's all for it. Mr. Morals has more light. He creates rules. Paul says in Romans 2, 3, when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? And the obvious answer is no. So Mr. Morals has more light, more understanding, and yet still it's not enough. Finally, the religious person. The problem with all of these people is they're trying to meet God's standard of righteousness. Now, when we come to the book of Romans, it is really difficult to escape some of the religious language that Paul uses because he's using these words specifically and intentionally. And so the word righteousness, what does that mean? The dictionary says, um, a theological dictionary says, righteousness is that attribute by which God's nature is the eternally perfect standard of what is right. Righteousness is the eternally perfect standard of what is right, and it belongs to God. Not only is God holy, perfectly pure, and distinct from all others, but God is righteous. He is the standard of what is right and what is wrong. When you compare Mr. Schmutzig and Mr. Morals, they don't measure up. And so finally, we're going to talk about the religious person, and religion is not enough to achieve righteousness. Take a look with me, if you would, at Romans chapter 2, verse 17. 
There's a lot of text today, so hang on. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Circumcision has value if you observe the law. But if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. So then, you, those who are not circumcised... I'm sorry. So then if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who, even though you have the written code and circumcision, are a lawbreaker. Some of my favorite verses in the Bible. A person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, And circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. Religion is not enough to achieve righteousness. Now, Paul's going to use two different ideas, the law and circumcision. And so let's think about the law. When Paul says the law, he's thinking back to the Jewish scriptures. He's thinking back to the Old Testament given to the Jewish people. And this law... Um, was created as a covenant, a relationship agreement between God and the people of Israel. And they were told, hey, do this, not to earn anything, but to maintain that relationship, a positive, good relationship between themselves and between themselves and God. That's a pretty good deal, right? God laid out clearly, here's how I want you to act. There are things in the law that are great, right? It says things like, If you dig a pit, cover it so nobody falls in. That's just good common sense, right? There are things in the law that talk about if you wrong your neighbor, make it right. Do the right thing. If you borrow something and it gets hurt or injured, make it right. All those things should be common sense. And so the Jewish people had the law, and this law was intended to bring them to humility before him. Not to make them proud. But over time, they started thinking, man, we've got the law, and all those Gentiles don't have it. (laughs) And so every one of the boasts that Paul puts in here, when he says, you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, all of those boasts are found in Jewish literature as they're in conflict with Gentiles. We are a light for the blind. We're the instructors of children, and you're not. They're boasting in something that was supposed to make them humble. And so Paul hits them with a series of questions. Do you teach yourself? Do you steal? Do you commit adultery? Do you rob temples? Do you dishonor God by breaking the law? And a a, a serious Jew could say no to all those things. I've never robbed a temple. But what Paul's pointing at is he's using these extreme examples to say, are you perfectly consistent in doing everything that the law requires? Well, if you look back at the moral guy, what what did he just tell him? You can't even keep your own rules. And so you Jewish people, are you perfectly performing everything that's written in the law? If you're honest, right? How many of you speed? Confess, right? Me too. Me too. Paul uses these extreme examples to provoke the Jewish hearer. Commentator Doug Moose says this, It is not then that all the Jews commit these sins, but that these sins are representative of the contradiction between claim and conduct that does pervade Judaism. In your practice of religion, is it perfect? Anybody have perfect attendance at church? Benjamin missed last week. And that's okay. Okay, so Benjamin is her youngest son. He's not even a year old yet. He's what, seven months? Yeah, 
He's only missed one day at church. Anybody else going to take that challenge? Because he was in church nine months before he was born. The religious person boasts in something that should provoke humility. Have you ever seen those super religious posts on Facebook, on your social media? I don't know why this person has a Bible between boots and the sunrise. This makes no sense. Are they boasting in something? I took my shoes off and read the Bible early in the morning. I, the whole thing is perplexing to me. How about knowledge that doesn't result in humility? Now, I, I'm a bookish guy, right? Every time I talk to somebody, I think about some book that I read somewhere. But you know what I, I want to believe about myself? That everything that I've learned through the course of my life is to help other people. It's genuinely to help other people. That was one of the lessons I learned in seminary. You can be, because I, I went to school and studied under people who are geniuses, made me feel like a moron. I realized they're here to help me. So now I'm here to help everybody else. Not that I'm smarter than anybody. The religious Jew is boasting in things that are supposed to bring him to humility. He's boasting about possessing the law rather than being humbled by the privilege. And so these Jewish people that Paul's talking about, these religious people are boasting in their achievements, but then they're also boasting in something called circumcision. So I have to talk to you about <laughs> circumcision. <laughs> circumcision is a minor surgery to remove a piece of skin from a man's private parts. The Jewish people circumcised their baby boys on the eighth day after they were born. There are some health and hygiene benefits to the practice, but mostly it was viewed as something that set the Jewish people apart. It was a distinctive marker of their identity as Jews. I have no idea how they checked. I don't want to know. There were, there were public baths or all kinds of things. They just knew that this was their distinctive identity. It was their distinctive marker. It was an external sign of commitment to the covenant that the people had with God. You see, they had the law, but the mark in your body that you carried around with you all day was that you were circumcised, and everybody else, the Gentiles, were not. And if you go back into history, then the time before Christ, the Greeks... So the Greeks uh, led by, okay, so Alexander the Great in the 300s took over the known world, introduced an idea called Hellenization, where he tried to make people become more Greek. They introduced Greek theater, they required Greek language, and they also forbid the Jewish people to circumcise their babies. They required Jewish people to eat pork. They set up idols in the middle of the temple in Jerusalem. Now let me ask you, you North American, Northwest Ohio Christians, how do you feel about the government getting into your business? They felt that even more. And so what happened is that these people would literally be killed by the Greeks because of their commitment to God. Circumcision marked your commitment. So after this had all kind of played out, so there was a brief period of Jewish independence where they fought and squabbled among each other. And then the Romans came in and took over. But the thing that lasted for them is that commitment to be circumcised and to circumcise their children, even in the face of death. It was a form of patriotism, a form of being together, a form of we doing what we believe deep, deep down God wants us to do. And so it's more than just a minor operation. And so Paul drops a hint right there at the end. He says, you need a circumcised heart. You need a heart that will get you right before God. That these things, this marker of the covenant and the covenant itself, the agreement that God has with you, is supposed to lead you in humility before him. When we sing holy, 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 it's not anything but us declaring what God is, and it should bring our hearts before him in humility and just gratefulness. But for the Jewish people, they didn't. Like, we're holy and you're not. That's the wrong use of religion. And we've seen these three people, the obvious sinner, the moral person, and now what Paul says about the religious man is that it's not enough. They all come under God's judgment. Who's left? 
Is anybody left out? Are you the most religious person that you know? I'm not. When I went to school, um, one of my professors, uh, like an actual genius, he, uh, he could read by flipping pages. He'd read just like that. An actual genius. And also one of the most humble, dedicated, passionately religious people I have ever met. He would pray, uh, he wasn't Catholic, but he had a, a prayer beads, and he would use a kneeler, and he would pray on a kneeler. Not publicly, I, I was invited to his home one time, and I saw it, and I was like, oh, that's weird, what's that? It's where you would kneel to pray, and he used it. He was the kind of person who would go on uh, spiritual retreats, not like the men's retreat, which was a lot of fun, but like retreats to a monastery and hang out with the monks, kind of retreats, sleep on the floor kind of a thing. I'm not going. My back would be a mess. And he, had, he act, actually advocated for spiritual direction where you would sit down with someone who wasn't your therapist but was also the person who would hold you accountable for your spiritual practices. He was deeply, devoutly religious. Are you the most religious person that you know? These are good things. These are valuable practices to add to your life, but not even that will earn you a right standing before God. Because religion is not enough to achieve righteousness. Religion increases your responsibility. Take a look at chapter 3, verse 1. Because Paul's going to just kind of like explode here for a second. He says, what advantage then is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. He says, look back at the Old Testament. God gave us this to lead us to that. What if some were unfaithful? He's talking about Jewish people. What if some of the Jewish people were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every human being a liar, as it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? I am using a human argument. Again, he's exploding. Certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Someone might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as some have slanderously claimed that we say, let us do evil that good may result. And Paul says their condemnation is just. And so Paul's kind of exploding in the Jewish world. He's transitioning to the next point. Commentator Doug Moo says this, Taken as a whole, the passage both affirms the continuing faithfulness of God. God's still going to be faithful to, to his covenant people, the Jewish people, and argues that this faithfulness in no way prevents God from judging the Jews. You see, accountability is a thing, right? Who's accountable to God? One, two, three, all of them. Who's excluded from accountability? No one. Like an attorney, Paul's kind of anticipating the objections of the Jewish people. He says, what's the advantage of being Jewish? He says, look, the Jewish people had more light. They had more understanding. They had more history. They had a relationship with the one true God. Having light was a privilege, not something to brag about. The second question addresses a common Jewish mindset. God has been faithful to disobedient Israel in the past, Why won't he just continue to be faithful to disobedient Israel right now? Well, no, because everyone is accountable. Paul flips the script, and he says, being Jewish means that you're more accountable, not less. You have more light, and more understanding increases responsibility. Finally, Paul uses a rhetorical technique called a reduction to the absurd. Um, he says, hey, let's, let's just keep on sinning. If God's just going to judge everybody, let's just go ahead and sin willy-nilly. Sounds like fun. <laughs> no. No. Their condemnation is just. There are advantages to being God's chosen people. There are advantages to being God's chosen people. There are advantages to having connections, Right? Surely you have some connections in your personal life. You have people you can call when you uh, need something done. There, there are a bunch of realtors in the audience. So if you need to sell a house or buy a house, throw a rock and you could probably hit one. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you a joke about connections. Now, I've warned you this is a joke. Play along, please. A frog goes into a bank to get a loan. 
as he's talking to his loan officer, Patricia Black. He tells her that his name is Kermit Jagger. When she asks for collateral, he holds up a little ceramic figure playing guitar. He says it's of his father, Mick. Patty takes the figurine and some questions to her manager, and after she explains the situation, the manager says, she, she asks him, what is, what is this and what do I do with this? And she, he says, it's a knick-knack, Patty Black. Give the frog a loan. <laughs> his old man's a rolling stone. <laughs> now, some of you younger people who are not laughing right now, you're going to have to go home. You're going to have to Google three things. <laughs> the first thing is this old man. It's a nursery rhyme. The second thing is Mick Jagger. And the third thing is the Rolling Stones. And now you'll know why all the old people are having a good time. <laughs> it's good to have connections, right? Would you give a frog a loan? <laughs> I would not lend a frog anything, right? Because he's a frog. <laughs> but what if his dad is a Rolling Stone, Mick Jagger, famous rock star? And what if the frog defaults on the loan? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yeah, you go to Mick and get the money, right? You're going you're gonna to call him on the loan. You're going to get, get your money, right? None of you apparently work for the mob. <laughs> and you see, here's the point of the joke, right? The frog has connections. The connections get him alone. The Jewish people had connections to God, but God will still hold them accountable, right? That's what Paul is saying. Because the Jewish people were relying on things like having the law, being religious, doing the things that they were told to do, having circumcision. And Paul says that's not enough. That's not enough to get you into an ongoing relationship with God. It does not remove accountability. Especially not with God's perfect judgment. Are you counting on your connections to get right with God? Are you going to say, hey, Lord, uh, you, 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 the end of your life, you show up before God and he, he says, why should I let you into my presence? Why should I let you be with me? Are you going to say, well, Lord, I was in church for nine months before I was born. God's going to say, that's great. What did you learn? Because it's not church attendance that does it. It's not having those connections. Well, you could know the most famous, think of a famous religious person. You could know the most famous religious person you've ever thought of. And God's going to say, I'm glad you knew that person. What did you learn? The Jewish people's relationship to God does not erase accountability, especially not God's perfect judgment. So finally, in the last movement of the text, all are silenced by guilt before God. Verse 9 of chapter 3. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all, for we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin, as it is written. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips." Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And the conclusion. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Jews and Gentiles alike, everyone on the planet, are all under the power of sin. And verses 10 to 18 is this pile-on of divine judgment where Paul looks back and thinks through all of the Psalms, and he's like, here's one, here it is, judgment. Here it is, accountability. Here it is, guilt. Over and over and over again, he finds people are guilty. And he doesn't leave a whole lot of wiggle room. Every mouth silenced. The whole world held accountable. Accountable means guilty. Everyone is guilty of sin before God. 
Commentator Doug Moo says the terminology of this clause reflects the image of the courtroom. Shutting the mouth connotes the situation of the defendant who has nothing more to say in response to the charges brought against him or her. The image then is of all humanity standing before God accountable. Accountable to him for willful and inexcusable violations of his will, awaiting the sentence of condemnation that their actions deserve. I'm 54 years old. And I have a memory, it's, it's dim because it's an old memory, some of you understand, of being about five years old and going to the corner store where, you know, this is back in the day, this is the 70s, where you were allowed to roam freely. And I remember going to the store and I stole some candy and I got caught. Rut-row. I don't remember all of the details. I'm sure that the adults that handled me handled me appropriately for the 70s. But I can also remember sitting and waiting for someone to come and get me. I'd like to tell you that I was scared straight in that moment, but I was not. I continued to do things that were wrong. Not just childish things. I did things that I knew were wrong and did them anyway. And I know the same thing is true for all of us. All of us are accountable to God. This text is sobering. All humanity guilty before God. You, me, everyone. And I'm not going to give you the answer today. 26 miles off the coast of California is an island called Catalina Island. That's a picture of it. You can see it from the coast. It's 26 miles. And so Mr. Schmutzig decides, I'm going to jump to Catalina. And so Mr. Schmutzig, now he's a wreck, right? He's the guy who's all about sin. He's the one who just keeps doing his thing. He's involved in all kinds of alcohol, drugs, womanizing. I mean, you just name it. He's into it. Sin, 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 sin. So what kind of shape is he in, like physically? He runs to the end of the pier. He's a little drunk from last night. Falls about five feet. What does Mr. Morals do? Mr. Morals is like, I'm in good shape. I can go farther than he did. Sprints to the end of the pier. Athletic almost got a cramp. (laughs) Sprints to the end of the uh, pier, leaps. Longest long jump in human history goes 35 feet. Mr. Religion says, I can do better than that. He hops on his motorcycle. Books it to the end of the pier. He's going 100 miles an hour. Launches 350 feet. And every one of those idiots is still 26 miles from Catalina Island. (laughs) Because you cannot get there by yourself. You cannot get there by yourself. And that is the whole point of Scripture. It's to bring you to humility. It's to bring you to your knees. I'm not going to give you the answer today because I want you to feel the weight of this. And I want you to come back next week. But I will give you a little bit of hope. I will give you a little bit of hope because if you look in your Bible at chapter 3, verse 21, the first two words are, but now. But now. If this is true, if all of humankind is together guilty before God, we need something. And dear, dear heavens, Paul, please tell us, but now. But now. We close with four questions. What is God speaking to you from this text? I hope it's that you acknowledge that there's, you're, you're one of these people. Maybe you've tried different things and you know we're kind, of, we're kind of known as a community of church people. We go to church. We do churchy things. We have religion. Religion isn't the point. It's not. It's getting your heart right with God. It's what comes after the but now. Are you guilty before God? Do you know what comes next? It's okay if you read ahead. The second question is very simple. What do you need to do about it? What do you need to do about it? How can we help? If you need that answer today, you come talk to me or Ruth Ann or Buddy or and he grab somebody and say, I need the answer. We'll help. Who else needs to hear about it?
everybody you know. Everybody needs to hear about it. So I'm going to invite the team back up to finish up. I always forget that there's an offering, so the guys are going to take an offering. Um, they'll pass a plate. You know, what, you know what to do there. Father, I thank you for your goodness to us, Lord. I thank you for the but now. But Lord, my prayer today is that we sit and understand and know how desperate our situation is. That there is no escape apart from you. And so, Lord, if there's someone here today who needs to recognize that and solve that, my prayer, Father, is that you give them the boldness to come and ask. And, Father, I thank you that there's an answer to this problem. And, Lord, I pray that this week, as we think and get ready and prepare and meditate on it and, and ruminate on it and chew on it and hope for it, Lord, I pray that it be all the more real because of the reality of sin. And so, Lord, watch over us today in Christ's name. Amen.
sing for all that you've done for me. Killing it again. So, last few weeks, pastors have shared with us out of Romans this idea of sin and uh, the, this obvious sinner, Mr. Whatever his name is. <laughs> Schmitty. <laughs> Mr. Morrow's the religious person, and I suppose all of us at some point or another in our lives, as, as we live, fall under one of those categories, right? But there is a way out of all that, right? And next week, pastor's going to share that with us. So religion, not enough to achieve righteousness. And we know what righteousness is. It's the standard of what is right, the perfect standard of what is right. So um, come back next week, and we'll hear from pastor what we can do to avoid all that. So give your best for his glory. You're just this is amazing grace. This is a